Hello and welcome to the British Sitcom History Podcast. Got something big here today. My name is Alan. With me, as always, is Gareth. Hello. It's the beginning of an epic journey through time and space. We're the doing beginning the of an first epic. series. Yes, <laughs> we're not doing the whole thing. The first series of Black Adder, the Black Adder. Yeah, the very first one. And you know, the the, the conventional wisdom here is that this one was the rubbish one, and it got better after this. And you know, yeah. I think we'll we'll we will talk about that as we go along. But today we are just going to focus on the first series, on the Black Adder, not two, three, and four. Yes, we will do those all at some point, I'm sure. But the, I think we'll feel like Black Adder is such a not just a big uh, aspect of sitcom history, but also all the series take on quite different subjects. So hmm. worthy of a, an episode each, I think. Yeah, definitely. And. Uh, before we get into detail on the first one, we should start by talking about the phenomenon of Blackadder, of the character mm. and its success. So when was this series made? And you know, how long did Blackadder go on for? This was made in 1983, mm. uh, this first series. Um, they did do a pilot in 82. And we'll talk about that a bit later on because mm. it was never aired, but it has, um, has come out uh, in, in the history. Yeah. And then there was a bit of delay before the the next series because, as we'll talk about, this didn't do what they wanted it to, and some changes had to be made. So, uh, yeah, in in the grand scheme of of Blackadder history, it was the eighties. Yeah, um, yeah. It fr- ran from eighty three to eighty nine. Blackadder goes forth is eighty nine, and this was the s- sort of a stalled beginning to it. Hmm. It came from not the nine o'clock news, I guess, yeah. because it was where. Uh, where Rowan Atkinson and Richard Curtis were working together. John Lloyd was a producer, uh, and those are the creatives who came together to make this. So my experience of Blackadder was, I I don't remember this going out, the first series. Mm. I would have been seven when this went out. So Mm. my experience was kind of back to front in that I remember Blackadder 2, I remember Blackadder 3rd, and loving those programs, and then seeing a repeat of this and thinking, oh, God, this is rubbish. (laughs) The general wisdom is, oh, it didn't, it didn't really work. It wasn't as good as the later series. But then there's always this kind of like, ah, but if you actually go back and watch it, it's actually pretty good kind of vibe. Mm. Um, and we'll see where we fall on that scale, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. But but we, I mean, the obvious place to start here was with Rowan Atkinson, uh, the star of the show, because this was his first starring role, uh, his previous yes. work, not the nine o'clock news primarily, which um, we've talked about Rowan Atkinson before. We've done an episode on the Thin Blue Line in which uh, obviously we focused on him quite heavily. So I don't want to go too detail into his background, but the, sh- the short bio he is, he was uh, Oxford, you know, Oxford Review and, and that kind of classic journey into the world of comedy, which we have seen uh, in quite a few people. Uh, it's obviously not as fashionable these days. But importantly, at Oxford was where he met Richard Curtis. So yeah. we've never spoken about Richard Curtis before on the show. So I thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about him. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Richard Curtis, a, a leading light of British comedy, um, really now, uh, as, as much as Rowan Atkinson is, uh, sure. by, certainly. Perhaps not, as, perhaps not as famous a face, but certainly um, yeah. in terms of box office receipts, I guess he's right up there with Rowan Atkinson. Oh, yeah. You know, they're the same age. They were both at Oxford. They met, you know, doing the, the you know, drama comedy stuff at Oxford. And Richard Curtis is a sort of fairly typical Oxford type. He was, he was yeah. actually born in New Zealand, um, mm-hmm. So, uh, but he was sort of an international child. I'm not sure. I'm sure it's something to do with his father's occupation, no doubt. But um, travelled the world and settled in Britain when he was uh, still a child. Ended up going to Harrow and yeah. then got, went up to Oxford, you know, so... Yeah, pretty, pretty posh. <laughs> yeah. Pretty posh as these yeah. things go. And but he broke through with Rowan Atkinson. Like they, they seem to have been working together right through entirely. He was a writer on Not the Nine O'clock News. I must confess, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know he was involved in Not the Nine O'clock News. That's where I yeah, yeah, that's where Rowan Atkinson kind of appeared on the scene, but I didn't know that was Richard Curtis yes. as well. Well, as we talked about before, Rowan Atkinson was the next big thing in comedy. Everyone knew he was. that he was gonna be that in the late seventies. They were looking for something for him, weren't they? 
Yes, and when the idea of Not the Nine O'Clock News came up, it, it kind of came from, we want to do something with Rowan Atkinson as the star, and he was a little bit like, uh, can we be part of an ensemble so it's a bit mm. less pressure? Yeah. So that was that was how that came about. And uh, interestingly, this, The Blackadder, is the first thing where it's, look, it's the Rowan Atkinson vehicle, yes. really. And, and he co-wrote it with Richard Curtis. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, looking at Ryan Atkinson's career now, writing is not his thing particularly. So, you know, perhaps mm. um, that should tell us something. But this is the one. This is the big pressure. They've, they've come off this big hit. Rowan Atkinson was not only the next big thing in comedy, he now is uh, the next big thing in comedy. Like, it, it, yeah. he is the big thing in comedy. Like, what are we going to do with him? We just need him to fulfill his potential. Mm. And Richard Curtis is, a, I guess, a friendly face, someone he trusts, someone they, they've worked together a lot. So that's how this came about. They're working on Not the Nine O'Clock News. They come up with this this concept. Whenever you read anything about this, they always say how they they went they want to do something totally different to what you were thinking of as a traditional sitcom. Okay. They were they were trying to not be faulty towers, is basically what they were thinking of. Sure. Because they don't want to be compared directly. And so they go for this big, opulent period piece. Mm. Lots of location shooting, uh, and, and rather than just sat in a studio. I'm guessing expensive, right? Very expensive by sitcom standards, certainly, yes. So, yeah, yeah. And that means pressure. That means if it's not right, you, mm. they're going to tell you about it pretty quickly. Um, mm. And spoiler alert, that's basically what happened, you know, which is why the next series are not uh, this opulent. Yes. But yeah, but I think that shows a lot uh, it says a lot about how much faith they were putting in these guys. They were only in their yeah. 20s still at this point. John Lloyd is the producer. He's still a young man at this point as well, mm -hmm. but he's built his reputation with these guys. So it shows a lot of faith, um, not just in them as creatives, but also in the reputation that people will watch this. Yes. <laughs> we'll we'll talk about how that worked out uh, as we go along. But I wanted to talk about Richard Curtis. I want to do a bit yeah. more of a deep dive into let's, Richard let's, Curtis yeah. because in terms of sitcom, he is a, a leading light. And it's interesting that it seemed, his career seems to be a series of sitcoms. So you've got, well, not the Nine O'Clock News, I guess, but then uh, you go into Blackadder, that's the yeah. 80s. The early 90s is Mr. Bean, okay, which again was co-created with Rowan Atkinson. Richard Curtis wrote some of that. Rowan Atkinson's a credited writer on that, but I think it's more in terms of creating things yeah. I, I, I as a performer. Say, I, you know, I don't I, think they're putting a script together as I, much. I, I don't know if, if Mr. Bean writer is the biggest accolade on cv <laughs> <laughs> well bean's very interesting because if you look at rowan atkinson's career equally the 80s is blackadder that is basically what he's mm. doing in the 80s mm. and obviously that was a huge success oh uh, listen I, i'm 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 playing my hand i've said this before i can't bear mr bean it is really not for me at all but i understand that on a worldwide success level it was mm. much much bigger than blackadder yeah, I mean, Mr. Bean made... There's no Johnny English without Mr. Bean. You know, sure. Rowan Atkinson isn't appearing in a Disney film as a voice unless it does Mr. Mm. Bean. But it's, it's yeah. because Blackadder wasn't that big. It was a British thing. Yeah. And I think you look back at Blackadder 30, 40 years later and it's still a big hit. And that says a lot. Yeah. But at the time, it was just a big hit. You know, it's, it's not necessarily something that's going to stand the test of time. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so Richard Curtis, you've got Blackadder, Bean... Vicar of Dibley. Vicar of Dibley is kind of late 90s. That's okay. his big thing there. And then in, in amongst all this, he made some films or something, but I'm sure. Yeah, you know what it's like films. when sitcom stars try to make film. It never works out. <laughs> <No. know? laughs> I'm joking aside. I, I, I know like Four Weddings and a Funeral was the big, was like yeah. in, in my mind was when Richard Curtis went Hollywood, so to speak. But uh, yeah. was, that, was that before or after the Bean film? Uh, it was before the Bean film, but it was, it was yeah. you know the Bean yeah. series was well underway, yeah. And obviously, everybody knows everybody knows Love Actually as a as a you know that's a perennial favourite every Christmas, isn't it? But um, mm -hmm. but yeah, let's 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 stay focused on the sitcoms. Well, actually, I do want to talk about a film, a Richard Curtis film. Okay. Uh, the odd one out, somewhat the one he made before Four Weddings and a Funeral. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's called The Tall Guy. Oh, The Tall Guy. I didn't know that was a Richard Curtis film. Now, I have seen The Tall Guy, but not since... Well, when was it released? 1989? Nine, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, I have seen that film. I remember, I, remember, I remember Jeff Goldblum and Emma Thompson rolling around naked in milk. Yeah, yeah. Made, made quite an that. impression on, on a young Gareth. Oh, I t I, there's, yes. I was thinking... Made an impression on me when I watched it last night. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
this is almost certainly a film you saw on Channel 4 in around 1991. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> certainly, sort of certainly. But yeah, I mean, it, it is a working title production. That's the company that made Four Weddings Funeral and blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, love actually all those films. And they've gone on to huge success, but mostly built on Four Weddings and a Funeral and yep. connections with Film 4 and all that sort of thing. But it's it's written by Richard Curtis, it, directed by Mel Smith. It was Mel Smith's di- directorial right. debut yep. as well. Emma Thompson's film debut. Yeah. You know, and Emma Thompson at her absolute prime as well. I mean, yeah, I mean, very impression, impressionable <laughs> performance. Uh, and Jeff Goldblum in his post The Fly pre Jurassic Park, I'm a bit of a cult hit, yeah. but nobody's quite sure what to do with me kind of uh, fame. But what I found fascinating about it, like I said, I just watched this last night. I don't think I've ever seen it before. I didn't ring any bells. But how much it's a Richard Curtis film. It's got all those ingredients yeah. there, but it feels a little bit loose. It's just like it's not yeah. quite fully baked. <laughs> Uh, so for example you've got jeff goldblum obviously the way he talks and everything he does is sort of this kind of slightly stilted dialogue yeah but you can just think i can hear hugh grant saying these lines and it would kind of work in a slightly different way and it's basically the same character he's a little bit kind of abashed and like oh well i have but i am yeah. quite dashingly handsome i suppose when it comes down to it sort of thing. <laughs> which arm don't you need i'm gonna lose an arm no which arm do you use least uh, i use them both i mean uh... You know, even when I'm walking. See? Look, 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 look. No, no, no. No! Uh, the thing is, the thing is, uh, all these weeks I've been coming here, I've, I've been wanting to ask you something. What I really want to know is, what's your name? Kate. You've got instantly falling in love with someone just from seeing them. Um, yep. That sort of thing. This big grandiose thing at the end to win back her love um, mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing. In a way that would obviously get him, definitely get him arrested. It would lose him his job and probably his career. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he, Rom-com but staples. The, the, film end, the film ends before anything like that happens. <laughs> yeah. and, and just very simplistic romantic overtures. Just really, really simple kind of boy meets girl. They fall in love and we have to throw a spanner in the works just so there's some drama. drama but ultimately there's just, it's just lovey-dovey nonsense. Yeah. And that's Richard Curtis, right? <laughs> and in Love Actually, you managed to do it 10 times in one film. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. And structurally, it's just kind of not that amazing, but it's fun. It's it's fine. It's a, it's a nice little film. But it, very interesting to watch. If you've never seen it before and you're kind of familiar with Richard Curtis and his work, find okay. it out. I might, I, might, I might go back and have another look. But also, one of his biggest legacies is Comic Relief. He was, you know, one of the architects yes. behind Comic Relief. Him and Lenny Henry were the principal and founders, When was that? When, when, when in the timeline did that happen? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know exactly. In my mind, it's sort of mid-80s. But well, yeah, yeah I, I remember, I remember sure. before the phenomenon of Red Nose Day, there was uh, like a concert, a, a gig with lots of famous comedians. It was just like a, a, a nighttime, a one-night gig. And then the year after that, Red Nose Day was sort of spun off from it. So I think it was just a yeah. benefit concert initially. Well, I wanted to ask you about Richard Curtis, right? Because, you know, I, I, all this stuff we're telling about him, obviously he's got a big place in British comedy. Why do I feel, and this is completely irrational and mm. kind of illogical, I can't put a good reason on it, but why do I feel like I don't really like him? <laughs> what, what is it? What is that? <laughs> I don't know. Well, there's, it's not particularly original to criticise Love, actually. You know, there's been a lot of... Uh, You've already alluded to in The Tall Guy how these grand romantic gestures that Richard Curtis has, has made a living from are kind of creepy. <laughs> so, so, so there might be a bit of that. I don't know, but I don't know. Is it is it just because he's so successful? And damn it, we don't we don't like that. <laughs> we don't like that. No, I think I, I've been thinking about this the last few days when we've been researching blah blah blah. But I think I, I think I find everything he does is fairly simple. Uh, hmm. that, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I think it is, and this is unfair to him. I I know that this is unfair, but there is a bit of a sense of what's the phrase uh, they were using to the manor born? Uh, is it noblesse oblige? Or is noblesse like oblige. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that kind of like, oh, I will sort of fawn upon the poor people and let them kind of have this. And the, the charity <laughs> work kind of adds into that. I think you know, it's hard to. Hold someone's good charity works against them. <laughs> but you but seem to be doing that. <laughs> there's a bit of the 
white savior kind of vibe about it all <laughs> and 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 like to be like i've never seen richard curtis kind of crow about it or anything he seems like a perfectly humble normal person but there's just <laughs> this is all going on in your head there's... yeah exactly exactly like i say i'm, I'm saying this is completely unfair but there, there's some i was do you know what i was thinking about this and I was thinking, like, he's the sort of person you think, oh, he seems like a nice kind of guy. And then you found out, like, he's a friend of Prince Charles or something <laughs> like that. And, like, again, not a bad thing, but it's just, yeah, he makes you judge him. <laughs> it, it reminded me of our talk of Ben Elton, when we discussed Ben mm-hmm. Elton in The Thin Blue mm-hmm. Line, and how he was this kind of anti-authoritarian figure, but then he became part of... The, the establishment, establishment and and so it kind of feel like we've been betrayed. Blah blah. We we were kind of more apologetic about him. Yeah. But I feel like Richard Curtis was always the establishment and kind of always has been. And that mm. I think that's what's rubbing me, even yeah. though I know it's totally unfair. Okay. Well, you know, you can't not feel it, can you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I at least appreciate that you're you're acknowledging the irrationality of your dislike. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's ridiculous. So anyway, let's let's um, let's get into the show itself. Well, w- w- the episode we are going to cover episode four, the Queen of Spain's beard. This is the one where mm. Blackadder gets uh, married off or is about to be married off to the Spanish Infanta, played by Maria Margulies. Mm-hmm. So that's the episode we're going to cover, and we'll go through it as we always do, scene by scene. Now, you picked this episode, Gareth. Can I ask why? Yes. I, there is a very specific reason. Jim Broadbent? It's because of Jim Broadbent. <laughs> yes, good. <laughs> M- my memory of Jim Broadbent's performance in this in this episode was so good. And I have to tell you, it, it was brilliant. It's the best bit about this entire series. Yeah. It, he is let's, let's let, fantastic let's jump, in this. We'll get to him. Let's come, come to him later. Let's come to him later. But yes, I agree. But I also think, you know, watching this series again... That is one of the moments that had stuck out in my memory from watching yeah. this years ago. But also, this this feels like it's one of the best episodes. There was this this one and the final episode, the Black Seal, were the were the kind of two that I enjoyed the most. It just felt like there yeah. was interesting things going on. But what I did like, and again, this is partly perhaps this is to do with the money they spent on it and the scope that they they had for the series. The episodes are all quite different, you know, the structurally and plot wise and location wise. There's a lot of variety in six episodes. Yes, I'm going to argue that's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> because my overall argument, my my the vibe I got from this series was it's all a bit too loose. Mm. And it feels like you've got this bunch of young creators who you want to give as much freedom as possible. Look, here's a here's a load of, a blank check and kind of do what you want. Yeah. But sometimes you need some parameters to work within. You know, yes. you need a few borders just to kind of keep you on track. This feels like you know they're not completely crazy. You know, they're not just kind of throwing all lots of stuff at the wall, but it's just loose enough that it never quite comes together. And so then you end up with things like loose character, which is really bad. Yeah. Principally Blackadder. You you can't yeah. have your main character being so kind of loose. What is he, you know, and the fact that he changed so much later on. One of the criticisms that this series gets is that the character of Blackadder is so different to how he is in the later series. And that's mm-hmm. a fair criticism. But I agree with you in that, I'm not sure what he is in this series because his his character seems to change between the different episodes. His 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 amount of weaseliness goes up and down from one episode to the next. His yeah. his intelligence is it's difficult to pin down how smart or stupid he is. It, it, mm. it, yeah, it's erratic. I feel like I'm going to come back to this quite a bit. Yes, uh, this is going to be my running theme. Yes. So let's let's jump into the episode. Let's. And we'll kind of okay, the Queen see, of Spain. We'll point beard. out things that, as we go along. So the the theme of this episode is Blackadder's success or lack of success with the ladies Mm -hmm. and we get a sort of pre-credits scene where he's up on the the castle ramparts and it's a sort of midnight liaison with a young lady but the punchline is she thinks he's his brother harry not edmund Mm. and she's so disgusted when she knows knows it's him that she pushes him off the wall yes yes Uh, uh, immediately humiliating the character and it's something we're gonna see again and again in this episode particularly Mm. but also throughout the series this is about a man being humiliated. Yes. And the whole setup of the character is he's the second son 
the king's second son. The king can't remember his name and sometimes forgets that he even exists uh, because his older brother is the favourite. I tell you what, I want to talk about the history, uh, the, how this sits in history, but we'll, we'll do that later, how this series sits into history because it's quite interesting. Yeah, the yeah. let's, let's talk about we'll, that We'll later. come back to that. So yes, yes, thematically speaking, yes, Edmund is the second son and is kind of a bit of an afterthought. He's the spare. You're right, humiliation is a constant theme throughout this series. Just to talk about the older brother there, so Prince Henry, who's played by Robert East in the in the show, he's another character who is too loose. Um, yeah. It feels like the obvious thing to do here would be to have in this very strident, heroic character who is everything that you want from a regent, everything... Mm. Everything you want the next king to be. An unattainable contrast to Blackadder. Yeah, exactly. The antithesis of everything that Blackadder is. And he's not. He's a little bit... He's sort of clerical, isn't he? He's like like an office boy. He's he's not what his father is. His father is Brian Blessed, who's this harumphing, Mm. battling king. Yeah, and and Henry is not that. And I, I, I can see why you wouldn't want him to be the same as Brian Blessed, just for character definition. But he, he's almost asexual um, mm. in, in, his, in the way he deals, particularly he comes up in this episode. Yeah. Yeah, he's clerical, he's methodical, he's kind of unemotional. He doesn't hate Edmund, but he doesn't particularly like him either. There's, yeah. He's just a bit nothingy and wishy-washy, and that comes through in performance as well. Uh, nothing against the actor, particularly. Maybe the material's just not there, yeah. but it feels like it needs something to hold on to. So, for example... Brian Blessed as the king, we know exactly what he is. Yes. We we know exactly who he is, and he never changes. And that's what you need from that supporting character. You don't want mm. a complex character there. Yeah. You need a you need a Brian Blessed character. And I think that Brian Blessed is one of the few people in comes out of this series think you, where you feel like he's done the job right, you know? Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> A well, let's let's stick with um So we talked about Prince Harry, the character. What about Robert East? I got to admit, I don't know him from anything else. Yeah, I mean, he's not. He's you know, occasional sitcom appearances. Nothing particularly to hang your hat on. It's mm. just, yeah, he's just a, a you know an actor knocking around doing things. But that's interesting in this series as a whole that the casting is not what you see in the later series, which is no. like, oh, let's put our friends in it albeit our friends are some of the most talented comedy performers in the country. The casting feels very theatrical. And what I mean by that is, mm. if you look at all the supporting actors, the people who are in it just for one episode, they're, they're dramatic actors. They're British dramatic actors. They're not sitcom actors. You know, like if you yes. watch a series of T- To the Man of Born, all the people who are appearing in that for one or two episodes, you've seen them in Reggie Perrin. You've seen them in other things. Mm. They're, the sit- they're sitcom regulars. That's yeah. not the case in The Blackadder. You know, Brian Blessed is not a sitcom actor. He's a, he's a classical nope. actor. I think that was deliberate. I think they they were going for we're making a period mm. drama and we're going to undercut it slightly and yeah. make it funny. Yeah. So we want our comedy star at the center of it, but we're going to surround him with these proper actors who do this stuff all the time and so it's going to have that kind of weight to it. Mm-hmm. Does that quite add up? No, it doesn't. Yes, Brian Blessed is that exactly there, what you, you expect from him. Yeah. And all the other actors who were in this are, yeah, primarily stage actors. Tim McCannany is, uh, you know, Mac- Whoa, 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 Tim whoa, whoa. How are we pronouncing his surname? <laughs> Tim McInerney. McInerney, the, surely. The, yeah, I like I like McCannany. Mac- <laughs> like it, it, has a, it has an obscure vibe to it. <laughs> But yeah, Tim McInerney, this was his earliest TV credit. You know, he was a theatre actor. Yeah. Was that a deliberate choice? I suspect it probably was, yes. Mm -hmm. Let's make a period drama with all the opulence and grand set design and costume and actors with these Shakespearean... You know, they lean really heavily into Shakespeare. It's... They they've got it in the credits. Additional dialogue by William Shakespeare. You know, it's, it's certainly no no accident. Mm. So what does any of that mean? Uh, does it work? Yeah. Well, obviously it doesn't quite work, does it? But well, no. It's they're not trying to make a traditional sitcom here, and I think that's that's got to be got to be remembered. Well, let's go back to our episode. So we we get that initial scene where Blackadder is humiliated, and then we get a Star Wars style crawl of text across the screen, which is kind of explaining things. Mm. To me, a text crawl like that always feels like a failure of narrative. And yes, I am including Star Wars in that. Like, yeah, if you need yeah. to explain it like that, then you're not doing the job very well. 
Yeah, same goes with narration in general, I think. Yeah. That's the accepted uh, vibe. <laughs> yeah, and and this doesn't really add much. You know, it's it's just some silly jokes, and they are silly. They are quite bad jokes. You know, they don't. Mm. I don't. I don't really think it's necessary. There's a cheeky little rape joke right here at the yeah, beginning, isn't there? Yeah, a little rape joke, right? <laughs> Different time. Yeah, there is. I, I, this feels like it's a parody of something, like a particular sumptuous period drama that would always start with some sort of pre-roll mm. thing. I don't. I mean, I don't know if it is. I certainly don't know what it is, if it is. But it feels like this it should be a parody. They've got Patrick Allen as the voiceover artist. He's a famous mm. voiceover artist. You yeah. recognise his voice. Um, he actually turns up in as a, an actor in the last episode as well yeah. as the Hawk. Uh, but that, but a, a voice that, as a British viewer, you've heard years and years yeah. and years over. So it feels like they're deliberately leaning into this overly grandiose narration vibe. Mm-hmm. But yeah, what are they achieving with that? Is it funny? Mm, no, it's yeah, not. Not, really. it's not I mean, well, that's, that's a subjective question, isn't it? But I didn't find it funny. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't quite. Like, but like as I say, I think I'm going to come back to this. It doesn't quite work. I haven't quite figured out what it is. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so then we cut to um, we cut to the King Richard, Brian Blessed, and a couple of his mm. uh, retainers, and uh, the, he spends this whole episode moving moving pieces around on a map. You know uh, yeah. what he might call statecraft. But basically, he just wants to kill people and shag people. That's 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 the characterization of King Richard. So so he's talking about he's talking about allying with one nation, going and massacring another nation, marrying his son off to so and so to form an alliance, mm-hmm. and that that that's the sort of that that drives the narrative of the episode. Mm. Now I think Brian Blessed does a damn fine job of this character. I think he does exactly what is required. You know what? For I, this character. So okay, let's let's get into Brian Blessed. <laughs> I actually don't disagree with you insofar as he does exactly what's required here. However, I have a really unpopular take on Brian Blessed. He just seems a bit much. Like, maybe maybe this in 1983 was the first time he'd done this. And, you know, it worked. Like you say, I can't really argue that it doesn't work. The problem is he's not done anything else since. He's just done this character for the last 40 years. And I'm sick of it. Uh, yeah, but um, this is post Flash Gordon. But yeah, I mean, he was a very well respected dramatic stage actor. I mean, well, my listen, main... listen, we've got to talk about I Claudius. I, I, if, yeah. if anybody, you know, it's not a sitcom. I Claudius was a BBC drama, a sumptuous based period, on right? yeah, based on Robert Graves' book, and it's you know the history of the early Caesars, and he plays Augustus, the divine Augustus. And he's brilliant. He's really brilliant in it. There's a there's a Amazing. famous his Oscar scene. Well, it's not an Oscar scene because it's not a film. But you know what I mean. Where he dies, yeah. and and you sort of see the yeah. light go out of his eyes. It's incredible acting. But but that's the famous scene. But he is very good in I Claudius. So classical actor, classical BBC Shakespearean, all of that stuff. And maybe you should have just stuck to it. <laughs> And at some point in the 80s, he decided to become a caricature of yeah, a bear. Yeah, he just become <laughs> a caricature of himself. And it, I, I, I don't like the caricature. That's, that's the problem. And if you don't, you know, you either love him or you hate him, I think. If you don't like him, mm. then it's just all a bit much. Yeah, I know what you mean. I think when used correctly, it works. It, I think they're using him correctly here, so it works. And, and I think part of the problem is when he does personal appearances as Brian Blessed, he's doing the character as well. Yeah. So, you know, maybe that is just him or whatever. But yeah, I know. I know what you mean. Well, we, we've seen Brian Blessed before in on this podcast. Can you remember? Oh, go on. It's a quiz. It's a you, quiz um, OK. And you know, I hate quizzes. I do remember <laughs> him in an earlier black and white thing. So was it was he a policeman? Uh, no, <laughs> it wasn't black and white either. It was in the film version of Till Death Has Do Part. Oh, that's right. He was playing a soldier during the war. That's right. He was yes, a soldier during I remember. The war. Yes, yes. In a very, beardless, in a very straight, beardless and yeah, hands- young... handsome. Well, he was only in his early thirties, you know? mm. uh, and again, not really a comedy actor in any sense. Um, the only other sort of really good sitcom connection I could find is apparently he did an episode of Toast of London. Um, oh, well, that back. figures, yeah, yeah, uh, which obviously adds up, doesn't it? But yes, yeah, so Brian Blessed at time of recording still alive. Well, let's move on from <laughs> <Was> that some <laughs> kiss of death you were giving there. You're expecting I think it's him to pass off. over between now and the gonna... editing. Look, the guy's in his eighties. All right, I've got uh... a good feeling. <laughs> okay, so during this, we've got King Richard moving his pieces, moving his horses and knights around on his map of Europe, 
And they talk yes. about they need to ally with Spain. So he's going to, he wants to marry off Harry to the Infanta of Spain. Oh, but that's no good because Harry's already engaged to several other princesses. But you've got another son. And we go through the, oh, have I? He's forgotten entirely that Edmund exists. Calls him Osmond. But yeah. the upshot of this scene is that Edmund is going to be married to the Infanta of Spain. Mm-hmm. Now, can, can I ask you a little bit about royal the, the, the diplomacy of royal marriages? Obviously, it's yep. um, a thing we think of as historical, but not really. <laughs> mm. Still, you know, 40 years ago, it's still a thing. The, the the joke here is that Henry is engaged all over the place. Would that have been the norm, or would it have been like, no. look, you're engaged to one person, it's bad tact you, if you... You, yeah, you if couldn't you be engaged to more than one person. That, that, that yeah. joke isn't based in reality. But absolutely, marriages were used to seal alliances from very early on, from Anglo-Saxon times, you know. The main reason that William of Normandy considered himself eligible for the crown of England was that there were marriages, you know, they were, they were connected by intermarriage. He had no blood link. But that's how you end up with your Victoria's grandkids ruling Europe. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> they just get passed around the country, the, well, all well, around exactly. the thing, all, all inbred. Exactly. So I'm, you know, I'm quoting 1066, you're quoting 1866. It's something that happened yeah. for centuries. Yeah, absolutely. And Camilla wasn't good enough in 1979. Well, well, unless you want, an, <laughs> unless you want to ally with a, a stockbroker in Hertfordshire, no, not good enough. <laughs> well, times have changed now, haven't they? You know. Yeah, we don't. Nobody cares who the princes marry anymore. No, and we're just happy that they're happy. We just let them get on with it. Yeah, don't bother them about it. No, it's fine. Anyway, we 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 find out that uh, Edmund is going to be married to the Spanish Infanta. So we cut across to Blackadder now, who's with Baldric and Percy. And he's nursing uh, dog bites on his neck from the opening scene, but he's trying to pretend mm-hmm. they're love bites. So there's some uh, some fairly tiresome humour that comes from that. It's a bit repetitive, isn't it? Yeah, it goes and, on a bit. Uh, I will say though, you know, we 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 sort of we're questioning the the character of Blackadder. He's weaselly, and it doesn't quite work altogether. But Rowan Atkinson is very good at playing a weaselly character. You I know, suppose. he is he is doing yeah. it well. So uh, I want to talk about the, the difference with Baldrick as well. Yeah. Because Percy here is pretty much what we get in the next series as well. Yeah, dim, of nice posh but dim, friend idiot. who is a bit nice but dim. Yeah, but Baldrick here is very different. And and the the kind of the easy thing to say is, oh, Baldrick's the smart one, Edmund's the stupid one, and then they swap over. Yes, that is the conventional wisdom. It's not really true because Blackadder isn't stupid in this. He's just weaselly, a little bit naive, and kind of grows throughout the series actually, mm. and becomes much more kind of self possessing. And Baldrick. He's not like super smart or anything. His cunning plan to deal with the Scotsman is to get him to trick him to put his head into a cannon. You know, it's yeah. not exactly yeah. a. It does work, <laughs> but you know, it's not a clever plan. But the major difference I find with Baldrick isn't is here that he's not that he's super smart or anything, but it's that he's not deferential to authority. Mm. You know, ultimately he is. You know, he knows his place at the end of it when it all comes down to it. But yeah. he'll talk trash to to Blackadder. He'll talk. He'll yeah. say whatever he wants. And I think. That is definitely something that gets refined in the later series that works. It's these levels of authority and the power systems that are in play and how our characters overcome them. It's how Blackadder really works because Blackadder is this really self-possessed, uh, confident yeah. and knows exactly what he's doing and clever. But there's always someone above him. There's always someone who's yeah. kicking him. And he has to work around that. It's why that character works. If he was just this big, swaggering, arrogant man, it wouldn't be mm. funny. It wouldn't be a, an interesting character. And the same goes for Baldrick to some extent. You know, we, we need that character for Blackadder to kind of be his ultimate, yeah. you know, kick down to. But here, Baldrick, they're, they're mocking him. They're mocking Blackadder. They're mocking the prince of the, the country to his yeah. face and <laughs> saying he's... Yeah having it off with the dog or whatever. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we need Baldrick there. I guess my problem here is with Percy and Baldrick here, do, do we feel like we're getting enough for two characters? Could this be one? Could Baldrick just be encompassed into Percy, his friend who's a bit smarter than him? We don't need Percy if Blackadder's the idiot, as mm-hmm. we're saying. Yeah, we also need a, a vassal there. We need someone for him to talk mm. down to. I don't know. We, because mm. we don't really get that from Baldrick in this series. No, it's, it, it, you've really got me thinking about it, it, the other series too. If they only had one, Percy and Baldrick, mm. would that have worked? I don't know. I don't know. I think we'd be missing something. Well, I, but... I think we'll we'll deal with this later. But I think we I could argue the same for series two. And in series three, it changes and it matters because yeah. that idiot character is now the authority in, figure. In charge. That's Absolutely. the difference, and that's yeah. why it, that's why that's those why characters 
works better for, for my taste. Well, hang on a sec. In black, in, in the third, essentially what we're saying is we haven't we haven't got Percy anymore because no. Prince George is is the authority figure. He's Queenie. So yeah. we now only have Baldrick. Yeah, I've got exactly. rid of that second retainer. I think that is what happens, yeah, ultimately. Obviously, you're, mm. you're developing the George, so he's kind of there all the time. But it's, you know, He plays it's a different role, yeah. And I, I think that works better. We'll get onto that in the future, but yeah, yeah I do think That's that an interesting better. comparison, yeah. But again, is that, uh, 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 to keep coming back to this, I want to keep echoing it. They haven't quite figured it all out yet. It's all just a bit loose. This feels like a, a, a script tightening could have perhaps asked that question. Yeah. But not necessarily drop one of the characters, but like, okay, how do we define these characters a bit more? Mm, mm. Okay, so now we get a knock on the door from uh, our messenger. And I really like this character. I think this is really this this messenger character. He sort of he pops up quite a few times, and I, yeah. I think I think the your actor does a good job with this. Hello, I bring a message. Yes, obviously you're a messenger. You are engaged to be married to the Infanta Maria of Spain. Hello, <laughs> I bring a message. You are engaged. Yes, 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 yes. Ah. Come, on, get out. Look at. Get out! 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 It's an odd one, though, isn't it? Yeah, he's... And as an actor, like, he hasn't really done anything else, particularly. Has he not? Okay. Um, but, okay, I'm just going to repeat myself. This feels still like half an idea. The mm. messenger is a bit stupid, and he kind of copies the physical movements of the person he's giving a message <laughs> to. Yeah. That's it. That That's it. And they've kind of got someone to play it who sounds stupid. And You know, th- th- there's a scene later on where they bring a message to the king, and the people, there's two, the three messengers, he's the yeah. third. And the first two are exactly the sort of person who would be playing an ensemble role in a Shakespeare play. They come in and go, yeah. my lord, the lord of Wessex has died, and then, and then scurries off. And then he comes in and he's a bumbling kind of fool. You yeah. know, he just looks funny. It's f- it's funny because he's fat. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's what they're saying. And he's got this kind of gormless face. Yeah. But that's it. It works on that level fine. But then he's, yeah, he's mocking. The, he's not mocking. He's copying the physical things. That, there's no explanation for it. It just, again, it's just sort of like, is it something they just <laughs> came up with on the fly? That kind of be funny. Let's do it. Half-baked ideas. <laughs> mm, okay. Well, I I like that. Half-fake I'm not idea. saying it's not funny. I like that half fake yeah. idea. It made me laugh. But but I but you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Okay. Yeah. So he brings the he brings the news. This messenger that Blackadder is to marry the Infanta. So until we get the sequence of the next couple of minutes of Edmund encountering these various princesses and thinking, oh, this is the Infanta. She must be really hot. This hot young woman. And and of course it turns out to be Miriam Margulies. You know. And and again, Miriam Mar- it's Miriam Margulies. It's funny because she's fat. That's you know, that's the point. <laughs> that is part of the joke. Yes. There's a, there's also just in this scene here. There's a, there's this tangent that they go off about the Stone of Galveston. This really weird little story that that Percy tells. You know, they do say that the Infanta's eyes are more beautiful than the famous Stone of Galveston. Hmm. <laughs> what? <laughs> the famous Stone of Galveston, my lord. And what's that exactly? Well, it's a famous blue stone. And it comes from Galveston. And I, I timed it. It goes on for over a minute and it's, it's just going nowhere. Yeah. What the hell's, what the hell was that about? <laughs> I'll tell you what, right? That was the one bit, the Stone of Galveston clip. Yeah. That, you could put that word for word in one of the later series. Right. And it would just be absolutely perfect. Well, Black Adder 2 with Percy. Um because Rowan Atkinson's characterization in that scene is much more later Blackadder where he's just going, Percy, you're an idiot. Percy's been an idiot, yeah. And then slowly breaking down this thing he said and then explaining to him why it's stupid. That's what you see in Blackadder Series 2. In fact, I could probably give you a good example straight off when Percy's talking about, oh, we have created finest, finest green. green. All right, so here's so this is interesting then. So I'm, I, I've launched into this criticizing it. And actually, I, what you're saying is right. I think that th- that... Yeah, if in Black Adder 2, that could, that would have worked, and I wouldn't be complaining about it. So it's just that it's so completely out of place here. It doesn't work. It doesn't fit <laughs> into the narrative. Yeah, and perhaps it's just structurally, this series works slightly differently in terms of plot and like where we're trying to get to, so this feels like a stalling point rather than just journey, um, whereas perhaps in the later ones, it's all enjoyable enough that we're just enjoying the time. We're not trying to get anywhere with it, maybe. I don't mm. know. Mm. But yeah, I that scene jumped out to me as well, yeah. 
Well, that's all we have time for this week, but do come back next time where we will look at more of the actors, including Miriam Margulies and Jim Broadbent, and continue our look at the episode and the series in full. In the meantime, do please check us out on social media. We are at BritcomPod on Twitter and Instagram, and on Facebook you can find us by searching British Sitcom History Podcast. And if you're new to the podcast, do check out our back catalogue where we've got lots of other shows, including The Thin Blue Line, if you like Rowan Atkinson. So go and have a listen to those, and we do hope you will be back for part two next time. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.